going to have the uh, Urban Renewal Commission meeting this evening for December 5th. Uh, welcome everybody. And Nancy, would you pull the board, please? Commissioner Neely? Here. Commissioner Polly? Here. Commissioner Roth? Here. Commissioner Smith? Commissioner Yates? <clears throat> Commissioner Peterson? Commissioner Mum? Here. Commissioner Edgar? Here. Chair Shaw? Here. Thank you. All right, so at this point in time, we have an opportunity for the citizens to um, approach us here if they have something to, uh, uh, they'd like to discuss that's not related to the uh, items on the agenda at this point. Hearing none, we'll continue on here to the adoption of the agenda. Thank you. Second. Thank you. No, no vote, Mrs. No vote. Okay, general business. Uh, Item 4A, PUB 12-016, Design Phase McLaughlin Boulevard Enhancement Project, Phase 2, Presentation, um, John Lewis. I don't think John's here. I think Alita's going to sure. substitute for John. I think we've got the price person right in the middle. Alita. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need John Lewis. Yeah, John Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Commissioner Shaw and Urban Renewal Commissioners. Um, my name is Leeds from Gadrich. I'm a Public Works Project Engineer. And with me, I have David Evans and Associates, our design consultant, um, Gil Williams to my right, and Scott Dreyer. And we're going to provide you with a project update of the McLaughlin um, Boulevard Enhancement Project Phase 2. Uh, we'll go over a bit of the project overview and background, um, existing conditions, our work with the Project Advisory Working Group, our upcoming uh, PSU Architectural Design Partnership, uh, the project constraints and design elements, and our design schedule for 2013. So the city has been uh, 10 years plus of um, planning and implementing uh, the McLaughlin Boulevard Enhancement Corridor Plan. Uh, we did, in early 2000, a uh, TGM, uh, Transportation Growth Management Planning Study. The, in 2005, the City Commission adopted a McLaughlin Boulevard Enhancement Plan that uh, provided guidelines for the design elements um, through this corridor from the railroad tunnel to the Clackamas River Bridge. And we completed the construction of the Phase 1 McLaughlin Boulevard uh, back in about 2009 uh, between the um, 10th Street on McLaughlin to 15th Street, and now we're designing Phase 2 of the McLaughlin Boulevard Enhancement from the Dunes Drive intersection to the Clackamas River Bridge on McLaughlin. And through a public process um, with uh, all the stakeholders, residents, business owners, TriMet, Metro, ODOT, and the city, and um, traveling public, uh, we've uh, created um, goals uh, to um, create connections between downtown Oregon City and the Willamette River, providing enhancements for a successful Oregon City 2040 Regional Center uh, to connect our waterfront again um, across the highway, improve safety for multimodal traffic again in, the, in this regional center and at the northernmost um, section of the regional center where it is uh, also a gateway to our, um, our city. And um, we're working towards constructing uh, these enhancements to make a friendlier area and, and calming the traffic um, through this type of corridor that is just on the north side of um, the I-205 interchange. So the, the uh, um, phase two project area, uh, this uh, aerial map shows you a little better. Um, it is um, McLaughlin uh, Boulevard, and we have uh, the side, the city's local street, Dunes Drive, on the south end of it, and the Clackamas River Bridge on the north end of it. 
the existing conditions in this area um, have uh, along McLaughlin Boulevard down to uh, city properties as well as um, private properties. Uh, fairly steep slopes, um, there's a, a grade difference. And then uh, shown with these dashed uh, pink lines, those are um, pedestrian uh, paths that have been worn over the years um, that show up on all of our aerial maps. So um, there is a lot of uh, pedestrian traffic that walks up and down um, from McLaughlin Boulevard sidewalks down to uh, our parks um, as well as to uh, uh, we have a River Shore Hotel there which has a, a little restaurant, bar and grill, and McDonald's actually gets a lot of foot traffic um, between McDonald's and up to uh, the TriMet bus station, our bus stop. There's a uh, TriMet bus stop on each side, uh, one northbound and one southbound, and those are shown with the, the green um, TMs. And just to give you a, um, some uh, photos to remember what it is like down there, um, usually you can't stop and, and really take a look at it like this, but uh, it's, it's pretty much for motorized vehicles. Uh, there's not many inviting amenities for really the pedestrian or for that matter the, the cyclist um, through this area. Uh, it, it is an area where um, motor, motorized vehicles are just leaving the interchange, as you see um, on the upper um, photo. And then the photo below is actually showing uh, entering um, this corridor and heading to the I-205 interchange. So most motorized vehicles are pretty well focused on uh, their end objective of either getting out or, or entering. Um, and as you can see, there is a cyclist that uh, is heading south there on the sidewalk, um, not, not wanting to uh, use that wide, wide like bike that. lane. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, and this is another just um, some photos showing the existing conditions closer to Dunes Drive. Um, one is actually show the upper um, photo is showing uh, the actual Dunes Drive roadway from the intersection on McLaughlin. And then uh, the lower one is showing a little closer photo of the interchange coming up. And then this is um, phase one enhancements of some of the traffic calming um, elements that were designed and constructed for this project. Uh, as you can see, a landscape medium with street trees, um, decorative uh, street lighting um, to improve the, the illumination and visibility at night, um, and then uh, a wider uh, multi-use path uh, heading southbound there. And on the northbound side, um, there are wider sidewalks that have been constructed. And then in the um, area of Oregon City, there are some primary bike routes that go through the city. Uh, there's shared bike lanes on uh, Main Street that go to the OC Arch Bridge. There is a Willamette Trail um, path that goes along the cove and heads out towards uh, the pedestrian bike bridge over by Tri-City Treatment Plant. And then there's also the McLaughlin Bridge or Clackamas River Bridge um, that, that's uh, on the north end of our project. And uh, also um, going south out of the city, Malala Avenue, uh, 7th Street to Malala Avenue. And um, then we actually receive quite a few bikers that head out on Washington Street um, out to Clackamas River Drive. And then just within the project, um, these are where the bike um, trails and routes uh, end up. Um, if, if you're going to go northbound onto McLaughlin, uh, you would be traveling um, along up to Firestone Alley and, and getting on the, the bike lane that, that transfers onto the sidewalk close to the bridge. Um, the bike lane is dropped. And then going southbound, you have 
the bike lane that is in Gladstone that drops and um, directs cyclists onto the bridge and then once you cross the bridge it um, then directs um, bicycles to go off of the ramp onto the, the bike lane that goes south. We do have a project advisory working group that's uh, working with our design um, project team and, and agency representatives as well. Uh, this is the member roster. I, I won't list all the names, but um, you can see that mo the majority of our citizen-based um, members are from the CIC, and we do have a couple TAC members as well as one TAC member is also a TriMet um, employee. And the agency groups, we have TriMet, Metro, and ODOT, um, as well as some city staff. And then again, our project team is uh, David Evans and Associates. Uh, the advisory group role um, is to participate in the meetings. We've had two meetings, one in November and one in December. And um, they are, have been providing feedback uh, to our design um, concepts and, and working collaboratively to set uh, goals and um, project values, uh, making recommendations, and um, we're encouraging including uh, community involvement in all of this. And now I'll turn this over to um, Gil Williams, who is our landscape architect on the project. Thank you, Lita. Um, thank you, uh, commissioners, for having us here. Um, as what we're, our role on this project, obviously, it's it, the main part of the project is conveying traffic, and so maintaining the roadway. We're left with um, common areas along the sides, and I think as the goals, the initial goals, the stakeholder goals indicate the desire to create um, a gateway entry into the city of Oregon City and enhance that and make you know, calm traffic, um, accommodate multimodal types of transportation, be it bike or ped um, or both. Um, and one of the things that we're going to do is, in, in part of our approach to this project, was to engage um, an architecture studio at Portland State University to help us think of ideas and to come up with a toolbox of ideas for urban enhancements and gateway features at this site. Um, starting this month, we're de developing a design design brief that will in essence capture the goals of the stakeholders, capture the values that we're getting from the the uh, the, the POG and, and hopefully with some feedback from you all tonight as well, um, develop a design brief that will create an outline and some parameters for these design students to address as they come up with ideas. Um, we'll, um, during the, the month of, and I'll give you a little brief look at the schedule here, um, in January, what we'll do is bring the students out, tour the site, um, have them meet with the POG members and other stakeholders, um, get familiar with the site. The design brief will also have a lot of this information in it. Um, they'll tour the site, and then on the 19th, we'll have a one-day design charrette at Portland State University where POG members are invited to come in and look over the shoulders of design designers. Um, and the idea here is to, to generate ideas and come up with, you know, get out of the box thinking, so to speak, and, and come up with some, some unique, um, they tend to think um, very visionary, and um, come up with some ideas that we can then distill and ultimately implement and integrate into the into the final project. Um, part of that process will include a public presentation on January 29th um, and to incent the students I guess um, it's a it, it's being staged as a design competition so the students will you know form teams come out on the 29th in this in this room and present their ideas and then through a people's choice award will award one team of students um, a first prize for that and it's a cash award that we've arranged um, the outcome from their design you know what we're looking for is a toolkit of ideas and and we're not going to take one winning design and integrate it into the final product I think what we'll, we'll do is take bits and pieces of a lot of the ideas and our hope is that it's not just architectural features, that they'll think also about the functional characteristics of the site, be it with stormwater, how to convey peds and bikes, how to make um, this a, a safer place and maybe a more desirable place for pedestrians and people who aren't in automobiles. 
And so um, we'll take those ideas and from the after the competition and and ultimately integrate them with Scott's work um, in the engineering into the final design package. Do you just want to go over that? Yeah, and, and as Alita mentioned, we've we've had two meetings with the POG, and our, our meetings were meant to solicit ideas on values and community values and how they see you know, what are some of the important aspects um, that we can outline in the design brief. Um, some of the things they came up with, um, you know, is how to maintain and enhance the, hor the historical, historical character of Oregon City. Um, Obviously, the gateway component's a big part of this. Um, how, how do we clearly announce entry? I mean, there's obvious uh, separation there with I-205, and how do we make um, or establish better continuity between the first phase of the project and what we're proposing here um, to make it read as one and try to, if possible, de-emphasize um, a I-205 overpass. Um, Obviously, another another key component was um, how how can design support economic development, and and I think in a lot of ways this is probably through enhancement and raising the profile of Oregon City, and by doing things that are um, out there that that might really give you a, a bang as you enter the city. Um, Sustainability um, was a big part of this. Green, I think that goes a long way. I think that you know we can integrate some functional aspects of the project, like I said, the stormwater, um, some of the bike ped facilities. How can we use design um, toward toward those ends as well? And then incorporating natural elements. Um, again, going back to consistency, the cohesion between the first phase and this phase are important. Safety was a big issue that came up that we, we will address. Um, looking at the earlier slide of the regional, you know, the regional connections, the bike ped connections regionally, how does this fit into that as a piece of that puzzle? Uh, slowing down traffic, it's, it will be a 40 mile an hour zone through there, and but I think through um, lane narrowing, um, the integration or the um, um, introduction of street trees, creating a canopy. Um, these things are known um, tools to slow and calm traffic, so we're, we're looking at those um, opportunities. And then, obviously, I think good lighting, so it becomes a night space as well as a day space. Hello, I'm Scott with David Evans. Thanks for your time tonight. Um, so my job is to uh, keep him in check, the architects, and then coordinate with ODOT uh, these architecture features, which is not an easy job. But, uh, <laughs> so I'll start out with the constraints of this project. Um, one of uh, we have a, a list of things that we have to follow in this corridor, and one of them is right away. There are no right away impacts on this project meaning we won't be taking any property. However, there might be one or two uh, easements to build the project, especially um, in areas that the new construction goes right up to the right-of-way line, so just give the contractor an area to build. Uh, but there will be uh, no new right-of-way takes, uh, which is a constraint here, especially at the pinch points, uh, one particularly at McDonald's. There's kind of a, a pinch point there. A um, couple of places we can't change, that's the Clackamas River Bridge and the bridge over the Clackamas Drive there. Those again are pinch points as well. We'd like to widen as wide as we could, but the bridges, we'd have to bring everything back in at the bridges. So uh, we keep uh, the design pretty much at a constant width throughout this project. Um, one thing I'd like to say is that we're not uh, changing the traffic patterns here. We're not changing the lane configurations. We're not adding lanes, taking away lanes. Um, minimal uh, impacts to the signal heads, if at all, at the intersection. We're not adding the side-by-side -side left turn lanes at the intersection. Actually, we're uh, uh, staying out of that intersection zone, that ODOT zone. That kind of gets us into uh, another can of worms. Um, we've got a couple pinch points. Uh, one of them is the ODOT message sign that's there. We have to work around that. And uh, I think a big thing on this project is the grade difference. Um, we are this entire project is within the 100-year floodplain as soon as you leave the road. Everything drops off quite quickly here, so any uh, widening that we do into the floodplain uh, will have to be mitigated by digging a hole somewhere else uh, so that we don't raise the Willamette River, theoretically. Um, with these constraints uh, come 
the bending of the rules uh, because of the architects there. Uh, we're going to be narrowing the lanes, like he said. We're going to be uh, reducing some of the shy distance. Again, these are known features to uh, kind of make the drivers uncomfortable, and therefore they slow down. You know, trees, things that encroach, come in on your peripheral vision. That we all know those are known things that make us uncomfortable when we're driving, and they tend to slow down. This is a 40 mile an hour zone, um, which for this project that will not change. Um, in phase one, we have a Although they're similar projects and we're going to try to create some continuity between the two, there is a large difference and that is the speed. This is, you know, a high, they're a high speed whereas the downtown was a special transportation corridor. It had a lower speed and some of the design exceptions were much easier to get through. Uh, we'll be dealing with street trees on this as well. Um, <coughs> ODOT is not a big fan of them as uh, because of their safety concerns. Uh, they don't typically move when a car hits them. and. Uh, we are hoping to provide some design elements to create a little bit more clearance between the two, uh, the trees and the cars on this project. Uh, we're looking at the bus stops on here, make sure they're at the right location uh, so that we have a good interaction between the people, peds, cars, make sure that uh, we know the routes where the people are going, getting on and off the buses so that we uh, don't create uh, unnecessary crossings or uh, put them in a situation that's unsafe. Um, Again, we're following uh, city standards, ODOT standards, and Metro Boulevard enhancement guidelines. Uh, I know this is a small section, and orange probably isn't the best color, but uh, if you've got 25 vision, you can see it. Uh, this is basically we'll use this as this. The orange are all of our up kind of uh, modifications or uh, construction areas on the project. Uh, it's, at this point, it's uh, very conceptual. We're not even at the 30 percent yet. Um, and I'll explain some of these features. I can go back back on them and explain them. Uh, what I'd like to do right now is, is kind of show you the two options that we've got. We have what's called the perspective concept. And this is what uh, the funding was put together with. Uh, you'll see uh, kind of the biggest thing tonight is the on-street bike lane. Uh, this is an ODOT standard. Um, it is. Uh, going to be tough to take ODOT out of that thinking. Uh, it is in all of their code. Um, and this is kind of the, the preferred alternative for them. And uh, with that being said, uh, the city, metro, DEA, um, we worked on another concept that I'll show you in a second here um, that we think is a little bit safer than this. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to point out is the narrower median in there. Uh, typically, you'd have a much wider median for this design speed. You'd have 12 foot lanes, you'd have uh, nice big shoulders and two feet shy. Uh, we're narrowing all that up again to create that kind of calming effect um, or making the driver uncomfortable. We've got a separated uh, sidewalk and area uh, with a planter strip and trees. And um, some of the pros for this uh, that, that uh, ODOT will use is uh, places the trees, you know, further if they if they allow the trees further away from the cars, it kind of gives that six foot buffer zone, uh, just extra time for the driver to react if he does have to drift off the road before he hits the curb. Um, the other thing it does is it uh, increases the area for water spread during events, uh, so you get a heavy downfall. It gives the water a little bit more room to spread out before it hits the lane and causes the driver to hydroplane. Uh, mind you that we have a design that we can design to, to we design to spread standards so that uh, that never occurs. I'd say never. We design to 25 year events, so in a 100 year event, uh, all all's off, all bets are off. But um, some of the cons and uh, are it's, it just decreases the safety by not separating the bikes from the vehicles. This is an area 40 mile an hour, which you know 40 mile an hour is a is a wish list as you're going through there trying to get onto the freeway and get home. You're kind of looking at all the message signs out there. You're looking at the overhead signs, trying to figure out where you're going to eat at Sherry's or McDonald's. You're going to make lefts and rights. The last thing you're looking for probably at dusk with the sun in your eyes is a bicycle to your right. Um, I've been over here several times and I, I'd like to say I had a passenger in my car take a photo of a bicyclist on the sidewalk. but. A photo was taken of a bicycle on the sidewalk while I was driving over here, and it just kind of proves the point. There's this huge eight-foot lane across the bridge, and there's a bike on there. Um, 
it, it just makes a lot of sense to keep the bikes up on that area and separate them from the traffic. Um, another another uh, one, yeah, another uh, con is increased cost. Uh, we narrow up the roadway. We, we remove some of the roadway section. Uh, roadway section is much more expensive than building a bike lane. Uh, you're looking at maybe 10 inches of asphalt over, you know, two feet of rock, whereas a, a bike lane would just be a regular sidewalk four inches over two. Uh, so it's a uh, decreased cost in that sense. And then uh, uh, just overall interaction, uh, one of the things you notice is the ramps aiming the bikes on and off of these bike lanes. It creates a kind of an unsafe movement. A bike kind of has to take a position to aim towards the roadway, and if you're a driver, that can be unexpected if you're not picking them up in your peripheral and all of a sudden they're, they're dropping into your peripheral vision. Um, it can create an unsafe situation between the bikes and the peds. Or bikes and vehicles, sorry. Uh, this is the option that uh, we presented to ODOT. It's still under their review. Um, I'd like to say it's going well, but uh, we'll have to see. It'll be an uphill battle with them for the next couple weeks or so. Uh, we have presented uh, a lot of information that shows why this option would be the preferred for the uh, community out there. Um, one is it's separate. If you go to the section, you'll see it a little closer here. You see we move the bike lanes off of the road. Uh, we go with a 13-foot lane, which is essentially a, it's an 11-foot lane with a 2-foot buffer. And uh, the trucking industry is on board with us. They are comfortable with this, and actually they're more comfortable with this because they don't have to worry about the bike and their mirrors with the bike lanes. Uh, we keep the planter strip, um, and then we provide a separated bike lane from the sidewalk. Um, and this gives the rider, either whether it be recreational or commuter, uh, its own lane, so to speak, to travel. Uh, so you could travel comfortably at an average rate of speed and not have to worry about the pedestrian interacting with you. Can, can uh, just Edward? first, we had a little vote on the committee, citizen committee. It went 100% looking at B, just to kind of give you an idea I believe it, of, yeah. of, of <laughs> the attitude. For the, for this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah just this is yeah. kind of like it, it was literally all, all based upon safety and then we're putting the burden of the sales job to ODOT on. <laughs> yeah, it's all on them. Yeah. Well, that's it was a democracy, but it's a nine against one, so it <laughs> should win. But um, so you know, one of one of the reasons that uh, you know I I don't typically like to go against ODOT, you know, because I, I always seem to lose. But in this case, uh, this makes sense. I mean, the the public, even ODOT, stresses continuity. And there are no bike lanes south of Dunes Drive. Uh, there's the, the, it's that for a reason. It's a narrow roadway. It's not safe. Uh, phase one has provided a great facility for bikes and peds, uh, both for recreational and commuting. Um, you know, they they typically are well. They the bike route diverts them off at 14th and puts them on a path, and then, or sorry, diverts them off at Dunes, puts them on a path, and then brings them back up on 14th, completely bypassing the interchange. Um, you know, if you're heading southbound, you're on the sidewalk. It's where you're put by, there's just no room on the bridge for a, even a commuter. And this proposal keeps them on their own lane until they get to the intersection. Um, we're still up in the air on the design on what to do with them once they get there, that we can keep them on and possibly dump them down dunes, or we can possibly give them their ramp onto the roadway into some safer passage than they have now. But uh, the point being is it keeps that bicyclist separated from the roadway and uh, to me it gives them the path that they're already taking. Um, going northbound, same type of thing. We, there is a small section where there will be a, a bike lane on the road. Uh, we looked at removing it but with the bus stop, the narrow right of way and all of the signal equipment that's there. It, it didn't make sense to bring the bikes on for that short block between uh, Sherry's entrance there and that uh, the main street entrance. Um, so we've, we've got kind of a scoop lane right after that main street, which the bike path comes up that side road and then um, goes up under the sidewalk and then across the bridge. Uh, there's It removes that uncomfortable transition at the bridge, in my eyes, uh, getting on and off the road. Um, go ahead and uh, quickly go over the pros and cons are pretty much flipped what I said 
uh, before. You know, the you know the cons for this is which the trees closer to the roadway. It's going to be a tougher sell to ODOT. Uh, we've got a backup plan for that, and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll show all our cards yet. Uh, reduces the area of spread again. We can we'll, we can deal with that. You know, we're looking at. Uh, more openings and possibly a planter swale, you know, a water quality planter that you see run right on your uh, downtown there at uh, 10th Street, kind of those openings in those curves. So there's ways to deal with the water so that it doesn't accumulate in the, in the lane and uh, create an unsafe condition for the driver. You know, we're looking at all modes of transportation, uh, you know, transit, vehicles, bikes, peds, and uh, so, you know, the option of separating those just makes the most sense in this area. And if you go back to one of the designs before I get to kind of the schedule here, um, I just wanted to go over a couple elements that we've worked through. Yeah, I'll use the pointer there. Again, our project starts uh, just south of the Clackamas River Bridge and continues all the way to Dunes Drive and then continues down Dune, Dunes Drive itself. Uh, this is an ODOT facility, so uh, we have to adhere to their standards. Uh, we have about five or six design exceptions that I talked about that uh, will be varying from their design standards. Um, right now the bike lanes go on and off at this location. Our idea is to keep them on their own separated bike path as, as they come down. Uh, one of the design features that we would like to see incorporated into this but we know it, there are some concerns uh, with uh, building out of this area it is a kind of a path that goes down and, and connects either to a staircase we put in or kind of routes them down to kind of their destination area that they go. Um, one of the things we'd like to do is try and take away or accommodate for some of these goat paths that people are using and they're going to continue to use unless you, you know, provide some type of alternate method of getting down there. One of them was a goat path down here. We're looking at stairs, possibly. Um, again, this would be an ADA access accessible ramp. Um, it does take away a little bit of city right away there, but my argument to that is, Paul, is uh, I think this would be a good area, since you've got to get the pedestrians up, since you're going to have to build this area up for developing it, into a plaza courtyard here, and then create a nice business frontage from this area right here. Um, just because the, you're probably going to have one or two levels of parking down in this area, not too inviting for a business, but you know, going up our nice new walkway and have a developer kind of create a plaza into a set of buildings there. I know you talked about on-street parking. Um, uh, Santa Claus is probably going to come and visit me before the on-street parking does in my lifetime with 40 mile an hour. Unless there's a speed yes. reduction, uh, parking is probably out of the question. Although, Paul, we're going to accommodate, we're going to try and get a wider planter strip there so that if a parking ever does come to reality, uh, you can just take out the planter strip and put in the parking without any um, frontage improvements into the existing business. So we're, we're taking what you said into advisement and kind of looking at future development here, trying not to impact. Uh, we're putting retaining walls on both sides of this, one to stay out of the McDonald's right away want to stay out of the city right away. We recognize that they're both valuable and uh, doing whatever it takes to minimize the footprint with providing access, an alternate access down there, I think at a safer location, away from the intersection. Uh, one of the things that I have it you know, shown as a big flat area, but uh, we'll leave it up to the students and the architects. This is where we, we will let them run free for a little bit, uh, is kind of a plaza area widening it out from the five feet that it is now uh, into a, an area where bikes, peds, and bus users can kind of uh, you know, get around each other without too much uh, interaction or conflict. Uh, we probably are going to be looking at an access down to McDonald's as well on the back side so that we do see that that is a heavily used path and we don't want to take that away. Um, they'll find a way to get up there one way or another. Um, a big part of this project is water quality. We're taking uh, a couple of things here. As part of the project, we have to treat 100% of the water. Uh, on top of that, we have a stormwater retrofit uh, grant through ODOT where we're closing off about four or five inlets that currently run directly into the river without treatment. We're going to be closing those off, putting in a new pipe, and running them into uh, a new water quality facility next to the 
at least the proposed location is next to the hotel here, uh, and treating 100% of that water. We'll also be capping off a few of these that run into the parking lot drainage and out into the river without treatment. We're going to be running uh, pretty much all of this water into these swale, this swale right here before discharging into the river. So thus treating you know, 100% of this project. Down on this area, we're still looking at possibly maybe a couple swales or some mechanical devices, filters to treat the water. There isn't a lot of water that goes off the bridge there, but uh, we still have to treat it all. One area that was open for discussion at the beginning when we put this project together was maybe putting this as a treatment area, but hearing feedback from you, uh, this is a highly developable piece of land and we've decided to minimize our impacts to it by just making it a curb tight sidewalk with trees and should it be ever be you know uh, developed it's you pretty much it's left on left alone uh, it made our drainage engineer sad today because he saw all the water flowing down there and thought it was a perfect location to treat it all and I told him to look somewhere else uh, we are not putting in a roundabout so we got applause on Monday um, it was part of the programming and funding, but uh, when reality hit, it wasn't a good use of funds. It wasn't uh, adding much function to that intersection, um, and it, it didn't have a high purpose. The money could be spent elsewhere on the project. One of those places that it's going to be spent is on this access road here. We're looking at a sidewalk on the east side, possibly on the west. And, that would um, be nice. We're yeah. going to be... Uh, that would be nice. But Firestone so Alley. So we, yes. we were told yeah. that the pedestrians go like like to right up here and they mm -hmm. take a goat trail right here. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to... Very dangerous. We're going to see if we can get a sidewalk on this side with the swale. we got a kind of 5 pounds and a 10 pound here where we've got a retaining wall we'll probably have to put in with a swale and a sidewalk. So we'll see how much... I can't promise a sidewalk here, but for sure on this side and we can always stripe a crosswalk something there, but uh, we are trying to get that sidewalk on this side, and then it can connect right up. And also the bikes, too, mm -hmm. they're going to come up this road, and we've got a kind of a scoop lane here where they just turn the corner, and they can get right on the bike bike path there. We are, um, I believe it's for sure we're going to be incorporating this part of the design into our project, which is a right in, right out. I know it looks like a big block right now, but uh, there will be a, a design there for the entrance to that uh, mm -hmm. shopping center, I believe. Very there, good. there is a set of plans that I've seen, and we're, and we're going to try to incorporate that into our set of plans so we don't have any throwaway or conflict or uh, problems with that connection there. We've got medians in the center. We're going to try and get bull noses. Uh, that's going to be taking the bull by the horn with ODOT. They're against those. So <laughs> we're gonna, we lost the first round. We'll try again uh, the second round here. Um, what is a bull nose? Excuse me. A bull nose is a, it's that piece of concrete that you have on... Uh, I don't know if you have a picture on the one, but down on between 10th and 14th at your intersections, there's that piece of concrete that's rounded right in front to you, your left. It's kind of, it provides an area for the car to hit before it hits you. So it gives a little bit safer, kind of a safety zone okay. for the pedestrian. Um, and then I think we've got two of those in, one at, the inter at each of mm -hmm. the intersections there. And uh, it's just okay. a safe refuge for the pedestrian mm -hmm. to kind of get tucked back away from the car. The car, it's a target for the car before it hits the pedestrian, so. Um, I like them, especially at this intersection. There's a lot of movements going on, and it's a nice place to, you know, duck and cover if, if you've got a lot of left turns and right turns and people not paying attention. Um, I think that's about it. If I go over the schedule real quick here. Um, so, you'll touch to. Here it is. You'll touch upon our schedule. Uh, we've got a 30% design. We're looking at January, early February. Um, that's basically to get the ODOT buy-in on our project before we move forward with and get to the details. We are engaging PSU at that same time during January. And uh, we have another meeting set up with the POG in February uh, to kind of go over our progress and show uh, Hopefully we can come back with some good news that ODOT has approved uh, the proposed design. If not, we're making the ODOT project manager come in here and tell us the reasons why, because <laughs> they have to be good. And uh, uh, it'll be his duty to explain that to the public. Um, if you want to go, we've got an open house set up for March, and if you want the overall project, 
next slide. We've got our overall schedule. We've got the 60% we're developing from May to March to April. Um, and that's kind of a working session with ODOT and uh, the city. And then we will have another meeting to kind of lay out where we are as far as progress goes. We'll receive feedback and try to incorporate any changes that come out of that meeting. Uh, we'll move forward to a full design in September and then bid this thing uh, in late winter and then hopefully get this thing constructed in one season in 2014. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Scott. Thank Gil, you. Gil and Lita. Thank you. Sorry for the sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're doing no, well. It, uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I was thinking about this like 30 years ago when I first like, started doing city stuff here. <laughs> we were worried about how trying to get logging trucks and chip trucks out of the city, you know, and that's created the bypass. And now we're talking so about bikes and pedestrians. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So uh, it's quite a quite an interesting phenomenon. I really uh, I appreciate the fact you've got uh, the. Portland State, the students involved, because, you know, here are the bicycle pedestrian people, <laughs> and you're getting them involved in this project, and so I think that's, uh, my hat's off there, I think it's looks like a great job, even though it's only a couple hundred yards long, but uh, you've got a lot going on here, so anyway, uh, Commissioner Neely, please. Uh, going through, I wrote down five things, and you answered three of them in the process. <laughs> okay. uh, so that's a good. Of them. Mm -hmm. One thing, uh, and, and, you're, and you're probably doing, I don't know that you mentioned it. I, I visualize when the, de develop, what it, the developments that are going to occur along the cove, we should be able to divert TriMet along Main Street right through those developments. Because the only uh, stops that TriMet makes before it gets to the transit, uh, uh, transit center are those that you indicate. Yes. So they can make those stops and then go down Main Street and, and actually serve residential development that will be occurring on that extension. And I presume that may be accounted for in your design, but if it's not, I think we should take that into account. As far as uh, designing? Well, the, the bus is turning down onto Dunes Drive and around Clackam, you know, uh, next to Clackam School. Where? Not looking at that. Well, I, I'm suggesting you do so because I hope that TriMet eventually directs its track. Yeah, you're saying uh, a pro providing a design that accommodates the That's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. Yeah. So the majority of this design is um, we're accommodating a WB60, which is the worst truck on the planet to turn. And WB60 makes it in and out of Dunes Drive there, which. Okay. Uh, absolutely, a tri-met bus would yeah. turn. The other, the other aspect, of course, is accommodating. I don't know why I would presume you'd want to keep a bus stop on McLaughlin there to actually accommodate both that and the turn. The only question would be at the uh, at, at the corner here. If it, let's see, right right here, we could look at this corner here. This would this one appears to be tight to me. Mm -hmm. um, the accommodation was the bus would turn head on into traffic. Uh, the design we'd have to flatten that corner out. Uh, maybe to similar to the radius that you see here. See how this this radius is much larger to accommodate the trucks. Um, if we were to accommodate a bus and look at that, we would be pulling that back into this area here. Mm -hmm. But definitely, yeah. I mean, that's a good so thing we should look at. The other concern we had looking at the, was where you're pulling your swales. That's pretty steep, and I think if you're talking about water treatment, uh, it's probably done in a bit of a flatter area and not wanting to go against. Uh, uh, one of our CIC representatives there, I think you should still keep looking at that other side because I think there are probably more opportunities on the other side of dunes to actually s slow down the water a bit in terms of the treatment process. I, I, I have a hard time visualizing how those So we have to speak then. Can you talk into your mic, please? Well, yeah. we, have, we have looked at that, and surprisingly, to my surprise, and I've walked out there, but the survey, it's pretty flat. Once you get down the steep hill right at the roadway at the hotel here, it flattens out quite a bit there. And this is a nice, it's not that bad of a slope there. It's really steep here and it's really steep here. But the majority of this is pretty flat because it follows the parking lot grading. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not too bad. Over here, yes, I agree. But what we're looking at there is kind of like what we did on the first phase, more of a cascading where it, it's, it kind of drops, you know, just kind of provides that, you know, waterfall feature as it goes down. 
Um, Are you going to write them? Excuse me? So one of the one of the problems with you know looking at this area here is this drops down pretty steep yeah. here. So if we were to stay within city right away, we'd have to put a retaining wall on the back side of this walk in order to create a flat enough base in there, and then we'd have to punch a new hole. Where am I at here? Punch a new hole through this roadway because we wouldn't be able to enter onto uh, city property here, and then the outfall is actually on city property as well. So it it opens a, about three conditions that would increase and slow, increase the cost quite a bit and hurt the process just because of the time constraints of acquiring property, uh, especially city property and uh, uh, Paul over there basically. I think the gentleman behind you has an idea. One, one other thing is that uh, this is in the design brief. Microphone. This, um, the stormwater will be part of the design brief. So the idea is that the students will be looking at creative ways to deal with that. And I think that it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be on the ground. It could be in a in a constructed facility that would deal with the stormwater as well. So I mean, I, I like to keep an open mind about that. I tell Scott to quit drawing it on the plan because. It, it could be misleading. Well, <laughs> you see what I have to do? I, 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 I was going to say that if you're uh, dealing with a structure facility, then you're not probably going to have any plants in it. You just said the river might not be on the ground, so. So, I mean, the nice thing about having swirls is actually having something that has right. land capa capacity. Mm -hmm. We've identified these two areas, but we're, you know, we're open. Yeah. Commissioner Pauley. Um, yes. Are there general guidelines or checklists that the PS students, um, our PSU students, are going to work within? For example, like a um, entrance oh, sign or an arch or you know something designating that you are entering Oregon City. I, our hope is in the design brief to outline. We don't want to limit their creativity, and I think what the, what we can do is that we we obviously have standards we have to adhere to. We have some some safety issues. We have ODOT. Um, and we have some physical constraints. You know, we obviously, and I think budgetary constraints, we're going to hit them with a budget and say you have to keep it within this. Um, beyond that, we're, we're not telling them specifically what the solution should be, whether it's, you know, whether it's an arch or, you know, what sort of gateway. What we're looking for is the generation of ideas. And we might take something that they come up with, or we, might, we may take something they come up with and evolve it into something that is a more appropriate for this. Um, I guarantee there will be inappropriate solutions. I mean, they're because they think really big. So, um, we, you know, we're going to have to. You know, he thinks he has to rein me, and I have to rein them in. So this is kind of what we're dealing with. So, so, so not to not to rule out the neon sign hanging off the 205 bridge. <laughs> you know, you, it, it, I was going to point out that you know this is this is kind of a footprint here of of um, what we've been given. This is the project footprint. What we're talking with the students about is contextually thinking of the site from the Clackamas River Bridge to the 205 Bridge and thinking of it more holistically because, I mean, you have this and you have a whole other section between the between Dunes Drive and 205. So to think of this thing more completely, and this will be the part that gets constructed, but how, how does it integrate eventually into the whole site? So. And at our first POG meeting, we gathered the values that the committee had, and it was green, it was uh, you know sustainable, it was durable, uh, revitalizing the historical heritage of, of Oregon City. We heard wagons. They won't see specifics, but they'll get the idea of, of what the intent is. This should be an entrance way. This should, you know, welcome to Oregon City. You should know that there is definitely a change that has happened and you're now in, in a new place. We also heard no biggest little city in Oregon signs, but uh, <laughs> hanging over the roadway, that won't be there. And, and another, another, to address real quickly, uh, it, this is a, identified Metro as a 24 re regional center, so I think that's important to think that this isn't just for next year, 2014. We have to think about it in you know, 20 or 30 years in advance, and how this space functions as a gateway into Oregon City for the future as well. All right. Uh, and a question was also: Is the Clackamas River Bridge is that already seismic adequate, or it has a sufficient rating? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It as far as what the 
seismic event is. Yeah, probably not an 8.0, but uh, it is, by Oregon standards, meets the sufficiency rating to not be retrofitted or replaced. All right, good. All right, um, Commissioner Roth. Oh, I've got three things here. One was, this is tongue and shirt cheek, please, so. I think we need to come off the bridge, up a ramp into a huge, big covered wagon in the back of the It's not a very covered wagon. So. And she's got a really good drive. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to sit, submit our Exhibit A here yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And time. Rocky yeah. students are going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky and his If students. you want the inappropriate first. <laughs> <laughs> the second, I'd like to really good at that. Uh, really, really appreciate you guys looking at what the public was saying about the roundabout and that piece of property and the bioswales and things. I think that was really, you did a good job in, in coming up with solutions for looking at the public. Oh, yeah, we listen. There's no reason for us to be here if we're not yeah. going to listen. Yeah. And then thirdly, um, I'm concerned, and I know you're not dealing with the space between, was it 14th or 15th and Dunes Drive, but the bikes just don't drop off the edge of the world at that point. Mm -hmm. So the bike path right now diverts them across 14th Street onto the multi-use path, down, down underneath the I-205 bridge, and then if they're going northbound, they go under under the bridge and back up on the north side, or if they go, uh, if they want to, as they come southbound, they're going to go down Dunes Drive. So we're going to be adding signage that routes them through the pri okay. proper bike route. Okay. Currently, it doesn't go under the bridge. Yeah. Uh, Metro's big push is to get, you know, sidewalk and bike lane connectivity through there. That is going to be an ODOT facility project, and they'll probably push at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, at right now, with the way that uh, your city has a bike route, bike route path, this to me is the missing link yeah. as far as it'll complete it. Right. Uh, with the exception of the bridge, I mean, there's nothing we can do with that, but it gets, it further solidifies getting the bikes off of the road before they go through the interchange, uh, which we don't want to promote. Because there is that big nine foot lane that is very inviting, but it narrows down to one, two feet by the time you get to 15th Street, which at that point you're sitting duck because mm -hmm. you're between a railing and a car. Right. So we really want to, you know, one thing we heard was signage that, that properly directs the bikes and, and we may do that as far as you know pavement markings or color you know so there's we're still out jury's still out on that one on how we're going to get the bikes around dunes drive at that intersection safely and, and guide them into the right location the other question at being a very poor bike rider and having to give it have given it up when you come to the end of the bridge on the sidewalk there's a very abrupt um you know it's you've got to kind of really Tangle around that end of the bridge to get. Is there anything that can be done with that? So you, which side are you at? Either either, either side. side. You like come to a back. concrete barrier and you've got to kind of go out and around real quick. Mm -hmm. And it puts it cars going towards the traffic actually. So as you come off the bridge, you're diverted onto the road. No, you're not or diverted onto the road. There's still a sidewalk there, but yeah, you, if you go straight ahead, that. you're going to hit a concrete wall and it's very narrow. So you've got to turn left and go out towards the road. I, if it's it, which it's probably part of that bridge and we won't be touching that it's, no, it's, it's one of those you buy something. a thing so we ran into this on the first phase we wanted to do stuff with the uh, with the viaduct and once you touch it you have to retrofit it so yeah, I apologize for not can you cushion it on that route okay Commissioner Roth, you okay? I'm right. you. Okay. I'm going to have Commissioner Edgar here, but I first of all want to thank you for your time and efforts that you spent on this with these folks here. And, stuff. and I, I would I would also <laughs> like to thank them a lot because uh, they have listened. I, I, I felt like that one of the issues that we've tried to talk about up here, if you take a look at the deal, is, is saying how can we make sure that these properties are the most uh, uh, can be developed not doing anything that we uh, that uh, makes them less developable so mm -hmm. that we can create jobs and economic development and investment mm -hmm. and uh, I, I've felt nothing but that they've heard that and they've been working with us on that uh, in every way so uh, the only area that I've uh, it seems like that have had any significant concern and, and this is something that you can all weigh in on is I've 
looked at the sidewalk, this one right here, and uh, the cost of that and, and cost benefit that we get and in that area and saying, does that hurt? If somebody develops along through there, they would probably be figuring out what they wanted to do. And is it, is it, our, is it our interest at this time to, to get into doing something that, and we'll, it, if we do something and it ends up being tore out by somebody because they're in the development of it, have we won? And if we take pedestrians and bikes and everybody and we do this right, bring them around here, I didn't see that the gain that we're going to achieve out of that really came out in cost benefit. But anyway, that's a decision. I, I voiced that opinion. You guys are uh, part of the keys of, of making determinations. But overall, I, the other areas that's of concern is the tightness right, right along in here with the bus stop. And, and this lane that comes off here, we come out of here and we drop down into another lane right here so that those are the two uh, southbound lanes. And so we really don't have a, a, a good transition right there. And when you put a bus in that area at the same time, uh, it creates uh, uh, some thrashing, some turbulence in that area. And um, the whole idea of trying to make it uh, safer and, and less turbulence. And then, uh, then another thing there is, uh, uh, this is another act of God going against ODOT, but to me, this area still should be 30 miles an hour, just like it is downtown, not 40. Because what's 30, the people are driving at 40. What's 40, they're driving at 50. And so the idea of getting the bikes away from those 50 mile an hour cars through there seemed to make a heck of a lot of sense to everybody. But also the whole idea of, uh, of if we could ever when they have this big sales job on everything, uh, if we could get this transitioned into a 30 mile an hour speed area through there uh, as part of an overall, you're coming into Oregon City, the speed drops to 30 miles an hour and it goes, we take it all the way through. I just, to me, that seemed to make sense, but that's like pushing a rock up the hill. Well, so <laughs> theoretically, we're supposed to be coming up with a design that will slow or calm the traffic. If we can provide, you know, even lowering the 85th percentile speed, then ODOT is open to a speed reduction. As it stands today with it wide open, lots of concrete, lots of room to speed, uh, they're comfortable to travel much higher than posted. So the 85th percentile lands right at 40 mile an hour. Okay. And they post it at that. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. However, at the end of this project, you know, if, we've, if, if these theories work, you know, then Hopefully that 85th percentile drops and another speed test can be done and, and there may be a stronger argument to get that reduced. But uh, as part of this project, and, and that's, that's not a battle that we would win. We fought it, we, we lost, uh, based on just you know, getting out of the chute with the design criteria to yeah. change it. So, okay, great. Yeah, we're good. Thanks. Good. Commissioner Neely? Well, I'm just going, people, people are going to take shortcuts. And <coughs> I think the development could support a pathway coming through that. You see that happening in various areas where they've closed off uh, through streets in the downtown area and the developments around, for example, Harrison and, and uh, south of there where uh, you've had a lot of developments, but they've been built in such a way that they permit pedestrian uh, conductivity. I think the same thing could be done here between the area that could be slated for parking, parking and development on the... On the uh, on the Clackamas uh, Park side and, and the McDonald's, uh, I think it'd be done in such a way that <coughs> the development could continue that uh, cut through and maybe even access of pedestrians in, to that area, depending on what kind of development it, it occurs. And there might be some economic benefits to it. You know, good ideas too. Part of the part of the you know the idea here is to integrate bikes and pets. And I think if you look at downtown Portland, for instance, where you have the 200 foot blocks, that that's it's a walkable city. And in creating these types of pet facilities, where it's a cut through like that, it, it will enhance and I think um, encourage more pet um, pet participation in there. Mm -hmm. 
That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good, Mr. Shaw. Mr. Oh. I, had, I had a couple of questions for both of these gentlemen. Um, I also share, I think, the mayor's view that, um, and and for Commissioner Edgar, I think that 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 facility bisecting that section there could actually add value for the development of the site because that's but for that presence of that facility they'd be required perhaps mm -hmm. to put it in so yeah. as long as it's not if it was some weird configuration that we thought would actually be in the way mm -hmm. of potential development I think you I think that's a really good concern how, but how, how much lot of, the, of, the, of our property will it be taking that's city owned property yeah so it's open for discussion right now it's shown at the maximum uh, multi-use path width, width which 12. is 14, 2 and 2. It's probably about an 18 foot width depending on the structures. You can narrow that down. I mean depending, since this isn't an ODOT facility, this isn't a, kind of a metro facility, we have room and we can probably narrow that down to 10 feet. It's it's how much room you want to give the bike passing the ped and vice versa. That's two-way traffic at that point. Um, so it's really what we feel is the, the best usable path. I think we're down at 10 or 12 feet for the phase one. We felt that was the between the boulders and all the the obstacles uh, that you know. That's historically, 10 feet is the minimum you want to go. Well, Plus, you've got feet. because you have fence yeah. and barrier, you probably want at least a foot or two shy. So you're you're looking between 14 and 18 feet of room off the property there. So, if I might continue, if it's if it's well used, I mean, this could be an asset. To whatever's there depending on what the business would be the other thing I wanted to mention is um, I know this is only one project but I'm thinking about how we can leverage value out of the at least the design portion for the entry feature because uh, as you gentlemen know Oregon City has a lot of arterials and main lines coming through the city and in in this network of of uh, transportation in Clackamas County and because of that, we're probably unique in that respect. Every city has more than one entrance, but we have multiple of these. And I'm sort of hoping that the, that the entry feature will have some design elements, a theme, if you will, that we can incorporate maybe in other parts of the city where we know we'd like to someday maybe put other entry features. So I'm hope, hoping that there'll be something out of that that we can get that will be consistent. So. I can't get the wagon out of my head now. <laughs> it's kind of cool. You can have little horse there. Oh, God. I'm going to pick that up. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess. You're really lucky I'm not a designer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, one, okay. and one thing, uh, Paul, if we do. If we do provide the stairs that we're showing there, uh, we will be required to provide a very similar ADA access. So again, that was another reason for putting that down there. Um, we're trying to cut those goat paths out. We know that we're not going to stop the kid from hopping with a skateboard over the thing and shooting down that goat path there. So putting the stairs there you know, would be a you know, nice thing to have. It would also, uh, by moving the, you know, putting the ramp near it, it, it again gives the same opportunity to uh, you know, people who have disabilities to make the same type of shortcut. So it's, you know, we can't, we, we did look at providing uh, access um, down parallel to the road. The grades just don't work. And actually for development, if you want to build up to the road, you would wipe it out anyway. So it, it would be a throwaway at that point. Um, so we have, we have, you know, tried to come up with some early on solutions. We're definitely open to here. With, which you might have for an alternative, um, and once we get the design down, we look at the sections. We can we can show you what the sec, you know, what the hell high the walls are going to be, what it's going to look like, you know, kind of in a 3D view, and so it's kind of hard to see. It just looks like a straight line on paper, no big deal, like a sidewalk. But it's there's a 25 foot difference there between the road and the road, you know, between the two roads. It's a substantial drop, right. and uh, you know, it's pushing the ADA limits at five percent drop that entire way. So we, we are able to do it without a landing, um, but you know maybe a landing is something you want to talk about, but again, not everything has been vetted on it. Just, just a thought, we possibly even look at putting a bike path coming down here in this right of way, all the way down to, right down into here, so as that we uh, 
we start uh, we pull the people right off of uh, off the deal and start over a, a quite a distance and, and just bring the pipe path down there and that's all ODOT right away. It would be an X factor exit only because that is about a half to one slope going into trees and then right into parks property. It it is uh, an area we're trying to avoid just because of parks property. We're also trying to avoid taking any of those trees because of the half to one slope. It's it's almost not climbable and. Uh, in order to provide a facility wide enough to accommodate a bike um, or a ped, we'd have to cut back into the slope quite a bit, which would re require large retaining walls. Is the road yeah. still down there? Excuse me? No. Is the road no. still down no. no, the no. road's it's still really gone. steep. It's like, mm -hmm. that's okay. straight, almost It just drops down. straight off yeah. right there. Mm -hmm. oh. so we're, we're trying to minimize the impacts there, just knowing that uh, even getting a construction easement there might be a process. So. Okay. Looks like we're good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to uh, 4B, and that's going to be the 12-243 Storefront Improvement Program Grant for 702 Main Street. Economic Development Manager Eric Underwood. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is uh, basically a continuation, if you will. Um, this applicant submitted in the first round of storefront application reviews, which was brought to you, I think, in September. Uh, but staff in their review uh, thought that there wasn't enough information. We were requesting more information to be able to make an informed decision as to the amount of award uh, for the grant. Uh, so uh, the commission, you guys directed us to go back and do that. We've requested that information. We've since received it. Um, and we've reviewed uh, the revised application. So this is uh, this project is, um, like I said, a continuation. They were uh, completed successfully completed uh, the Main Street portion of the project in July of, of this year. Uh, this is the side of the building. I like to call it a facade improvement grant or facade improvement grant. Excuse me. Um, so this is just a continuation down 7th Street uh, using the same materials, uh, reconfiguring the entryways, uh, lengthening the windows from the street level uh, to restore it back to its almost original uh, facade look. Um, so based on the review and the scoring uh, that the staff uh, submitted, uh, it, it exceeds the 70% threshold, the minimum 70%. Uh, and with the score, I think the average scoring was 87.6 percent, uh, which uh, led us to recommending an amount for the grant for $35,040 for this grant. How much was that again? $35,040. Yeah. Okay, let me get back over here. I think uh, <laughs> let's go back here. You have to turn your head sideways. I know it. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to the floor here. See who's uh, who's speaking here. Okay, I'm on the floor. Okay, um, any discussion here? I, I don't. I don't have an area. I think first. Even though it doesn't have the columns yet, I was so pleased with these, uh, with the Main Street portion of the Bank of uh, Commerce building, and they've done a great job. <coughs> Although we hope to see more on the front on that street, I, I, I think it'd be great to take this onto the additional street personally. <coughs> are the uh, they here tonight? Would yeah, you like? Concern here, yes. Yeah, come forward and because uh, we may have a few <coughs> questions here. You never know. Kind of introduce yourselves and your address, please. Gary Miller, Orange City. Jerry Burns, West Lynn. All right, guys, thanks. Okay. Um, so, Commissioner Neely, are you? I'm good. Okay. And Commissioner yeah. Smith. <laughs> um, I would echo what was just said. Uh, the front looks great. Um, at, at one time, you had a concept of an awning and then that whole discussion about the pillars came up so is that being left then off correct and then um, 
have the pillars completely left your your vision for this building? No, not at all. Okay, because uh, I don't want to keep giving money if, we, if it's not. <laughs> I, think, I think. I mean, I, I want to see this. I, I want to definitely see the Seventh uh, Street side of the building fixed. And the only thing I was looking here. Um, was the sizing of the windows on the lower front, and then when I pulled out all my pictures and looked at them, it actually does go back to what I, th I it, mm -hmm. the way the window, the way the corner window was on the front of the building, I didn't think matched the historic building, which, it, but it actually does fairly well, so I, I, I'm really happy about that. Um, the only other thing on the, the uh, what I think is the most recent picture of the Seventh Street side of the building, there's a fire escape. Over is that still there? That's been removed. But that's not there. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was there or not. I saw this photo on that. How does that affect the design of the building? But if it's gone, and then um, I'm assuming. So I'm assuming that this is phase two. There's a phase three and a phase four. <laughs> um, maybe three being, well, three or four either way, whichever way you flip it. Because the back of the building is god awful, um, and I don't know what the plan is for the back of the building, which is extremely like dead center to the view of the elevator. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, hopefully, that's that's on the agenda at some point. And then, of course, the columns. So, um, but I think what you're doing is amazing. I just I just don't want to see us commit to so much to this building and then find out ah we decided not to do the columns because that will really irritate me. <laughs> you get well, no. All right. If I can add, not that I won't vote for it because of that. But but it, it really, you know, it, it, we like to. We don't want to do anything halfway. It's like you know, in the Ermatinger house, it's like okay, we want to make sure we have the amount of money to fix it right. Um, this building, I would hate to see us help partner in making this building almost right. Um, and and so I definitely. Over the last couple um, presentations, I'm starting to get a little concerned that, okay, we might be being led on a little bit about the, the, the columns. So I want to bring it up as much as possible because I really <laughs> believe that, is, that needs to happen at some point. I, I agree. Those columns were a very mm -hmm. important part of the design, mm -hmm. looking at those old photos that just changed the whole characteristic of the building. Okay. I don't know if you have an answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's right. If, if yeah. the, uh, the commission can remember, it's, it's been a while on this project, but back uh, November 4th of 2011, we actually had the architect here and did a presentation of what the plan was with the columns. Uh -huh. uh, at that point, that was still after the continuation of the work down 7th Street. Right. So we were allotted the amount to have that evaluation done. Right. Um, so as a reminder, that process has been been completed. Uh, the planning and the design is with the intention that the columns will be there. So it's just beautification of the rest of the building right. to get to that point. Right. right. This is Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Commissioner this is, Neely. Yeah, this is a direct follow-up. And it sounds like you used the allocation. We allocated a specific money, amount of money right. for an architect to look at it. And you said you've done so and and, and you have a design. And he actually gave a presentation in front yeah. of the commission. Right. As a yeah. result of that. And that was from that yeah, yes. funding. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yep. All right, uh, Commissioner Edgar. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, if this building wasn't such an important corner, yeah. uh, where everybody sees it coming off of this beautiful bridge, uh, you wouldn't have as much traction, but boy, you have traction. <laughs> 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 it's, we, were, what, we want it to be right. And you do too. And I don't uh, know if that's called traction. Though. <laughs> 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 it, it's when, it's just a too it's just seen by too many people, and 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 your improvements kind of help improve the image of all of downtown, and j just because of the amount of visibility that you have. So, uh, and you, I'm, if you remember back, I had. Miles, uh, mm -hmm. the owner of Miles Fiberglass, agreed to go down to Astoria, where he would take a mold of existing c columns that are identical to what are missing, and would help fabricate them. Uh, what we needed, so um, we had a local business willing to step forward 
and at that moment uh, the events just didn't allow them to proceed ahead but we have that ability and to do it and the building sits down there in Astoria which is in fact their city hall so it's uh, it's easy to get done but I, I have to agree that uh, what you did it looks great yeah. if we can con continue it down uh, 7th Street to uh, that part uh, uh, we are taking steps forward which are positive for the city and I think that uh, all of this uh, uh, has a return on investment which is always very important to me because it's going to create a more positive economic and business environment in Oregon City and uh, I think out of those areas where we've spent some money these are some of the areas where we've had better returns and uh, positive returns not only physical but psychological uh, in getting our city looking right so for me I think it's uh, they have too much traction their cause to me makes sense. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, if you called the back of the building god awful, just remember what the front of it used to look like. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, that was horrible. That's definitely a disadvantage. Yeah. I, um, if any of you haven't, it, it's 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 great to go look at pictures from Oregon City ten years ago because we forget. Absolutely. It was horrible. <laughs> uh, go look at some pictures of Main Street and Oregon City all over 7th Street 10 years ago. Um, yep. It's a different place. Right. Uh, Commissioner Roth. Well, I, I have a question because I'm not understanding. From these pictures, I don't understand how much of that building. Is it the entire block? Yeah. No, no, it goes to the uh, oh, coin, coin and hobby shop. Coin and hobby shop. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Okay, the so building. they don't have to dig it back to the building. No, the back of the bill, upper two Our building floors. is taller than the yeah. Yeah. Hobby yeah. Right. So it's the upper back part that's, oh, that's looked at that. visible from okay. the elevator. No. My second thing <laughs> is, is I can't tell from these pictures. There's a gas meter out there on 7th Street. And is that going to go away or move somewhere else that's not? Because I happened to be down there one day when someone came along in a wheelchair and hit it at a very high speed, and we had to close down the street and call the fire department. Um, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's in the way when that sidewalk gets crowded, especially now that there's trees and things down there. And I would just I ask don't if you could look at that. Because it, it is pretty obtrusive out to the sidewalk. And we've got that wood-fired pizza place right across the street, and the gas was going in. It was not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, all right, so... Any other questions, or we're going to accept a motion here? I don't know how to do it. I move to approve. So on the what? screen. It's on the screen. Oh. Somewhere? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> on the floor. It's not moving. It's not doing anything. No. Sorry. Not? No. Nope. Okay. Okay. <laughs> We've got a. Um, can you be more specific in your motion? I move to uh, approve the uh, storefront improvement grant for 702 Main Street, as uh, as outlined. Yep. Commissioner Polly. Yes. Commissioner Mum. Aye. Commissioner Roth. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Commissioner Neely. Aye. Commissioner Edgar. Yes. Commissioner Peterson. Stand. And Chair Shaw. Aye. Motion All right. Go. Got a fairly unanimous vote there, guys. We Thank look you forward guys. to the next one here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, we got consent agenda. Uh, consent <laughs> agenda. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Last night. Last night. I got uh, I would like to pull something from the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. 5D. Okay. Simply because I just would like a better explanation. Than so the motion then will be for to approve 5A, B, and C. Wait until it was cold and wet. Is, we have a visitor. 
Move to approve. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Polly. Um, aye. Commissioner Mum? Aye. Commissioner Roth? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Neely? Aye. Commissioner Edgar? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. And Chair Shaw? Aye. Okay. Uh, do we move on to future agenda items? Oh, I'm going to do 5B. Okay. It might be a little loud. Yeah, I, re I read, the th I just would like a little bit of an explanation background on that one because I know that it's in both the commission meeting and in this meeting, yeah. and it's a little confusing. Okay. Can you do that, Nancy, or? It's uh, Eric Underwood. I'll, I'll, oh, okay. I'll do that. I'll attempt to do that. Uh, basically, uh, our uh, urban renewal attorney, Steve Janik of Ball Janik, uh, is also representing the bankruptcy trustee uh, for the Blue Heron site. Mm -hmm. And this is just basically a formality, a letter uh, to have the City Commission and the Urban Renewal Commission approve a conflict waiver or to waive uh, any potential conflict. Uh, right now, the way they've, uh, Ball Janik has looked at it, that any of the projects that he's involved with now, currently with us, do not conflict with the work that he'll be doing with the bankruptcy trustee for Blue Heron. So he'll be representing uh, the trustee and land use mm -hmm. issues as they move forward through their due diligence and, and visioning for that, that property. So. so you're saying that right now any of the projects he's involved in, but what about the future? Anticipated and current projects. The, what he sees, none of the projects will conflict with the work that he's doing with the if trustee. I, if I can add, the, the bar rules require attorneys to notify clients when they have a potential conflict. Okay, so it'll come back to us. So they have to notify you when there's a potential conflict. They can't even work on it unless they notify you and you consent to them doing it. Then when there becomes an actual conflict, then we'll be waving our arms or they will or we will, there will be a different uh, an opportunity then to say, well, we have now have an actual conflict. Okay. Um, and and that's when we probably will all agree that we need somebody different. Okay. This is just basically approval to proceed with you. Thank you. And they have to have it from both clients, by the way, so right. that's why it's... Okay. Okay. I'm fine with it now. Okay. <laughs> so we'll need a motion. And okay. Second. I'll move to um, approve the 5D Balgenic Conflict Waiver Request. Second. We'll take okay. it here. A uh, motion by Commissioner Ross, second by Commissioner Smith. Commissioner okay. Polly. Aye. Commissioner Mum? Aye. Commissioner Roth? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Neely? Aye. Commissioner Edgar? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Chair Shaw? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Future agenda items, please. Uh, we shall move on to city manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we had a vandalism at the um, at the train depot, and someone tried to go in and cut off some of the copper tubing, and were they were caught, and the police made an arrest. And Eric's gonna—it's I think about a thousand dollars worth of damage. A little under a thousand dollars. It wasn't too much. They forced entry through the rear, broke some glass, messed up the HVAC system a little bit, and the electrical components in the rear of the building. So. We'll be seeking restitution, but restitution depends on ability to pay, so mm -hmm. no guarantee there, but Eric's going to be following up on that. Great. And then lastly, uh, I think tonight is Chair Shaw and Graham mm -hmm. Peterson's yes. last night with us uh, on the commission, and um, I'm sure lots of people have things to say, but one of the things I want to mention is that um, a year ago, the way this commission interacted with each other was drastically different. And I think there's a lot of credit that is due to your leadership, Chair Shaw, and also to Graham, your quiet, uh, sometimes too quiet demeanor <laughs> up there and your willingness to work with others. You guys have really, I think, helped the rest of the group recognize that there is a better way of doing things. And I don't think we could have done that without a lot of help from everybody in this yeah. room, including mm -hmm. this gentleman. But my hat's off to you. Thank you so much for your service. Yes. I really appreciate it. I would say so. Uh, 
I think a lot of the success of this commission uh, stems from the fact that Brian Shaw is, uh, has been a, a good chair and he's, he's uh, positioned himself in the right position. He sits between myself and Paul Edgar. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, your observation on Graham, I think, is correct. But what I noticed was that he, uh, I'm sure he's very studious in everything he does, but when we've had conflicts, he's, he's come forward as a soft-spoken yeah. voice that has actually brought us to some resolutions that might have been more difficult than otherwise. And I really yes. appreciate yes. that. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you've been a you've been an effective mediator, I think, in, a, in more than one instance. <laughs> I just also like to say that um, you know I I thank you both for making my transition into Oregon City um, a smooth process. Um, it's been very pleasurable. It's, it's been great working with the both of you, and uh, I wish you the best of luck in the future. So thank you. Well, thanks everybody, and I. Uh I know, you know, I, I got to watch uh, Don Slack and Rob Crocker, and you know, they had they had a lot to do with this too. And then I got to see how not to do it. And then, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I just kind of uh, picked from all of that, you know. So I don't know whether my speech is uh, I have a dream speech or it's it takes a village speech. Oh. <laughs> you know, maybe it's a combination of both. <laughs> but, uh, it takes a village to have a dream. Yes, yes, right. you know, and, uh, in, this is it's a group effort here. It's not because of myself. It's maybe really Graham too, you know. But uh, he is a he's, he's, he, you know when you when you get him going, he's he's on top of the yes, yes, you know, yes. And I apologize, I had to pull it out of you once in a while, Graham. But uh, <laughs> appreciate your efforts and everybody else here too. So okay, thanks.